I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you're safe and above all, uh, very healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual discussions, at least for now, uh, of issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Uh, today, I'm truly pleased and honored to welcome Ambassador Marie Ivanovich um, to Carnegie Connects. Uh, Masha, if I can call you that, um, I hope so. Welcome. Um, Thank you. You're, you're, you're a former colleague at the Department of State and a current colleague at Carnegie, so I look forward to a lot of interaction. You know, let me begin this way. When I left the State Department in 2003, Secretary Powell gave me two pieces of advice. Number one, don't try to come back, uh, which I totally accepted. Um, and the second piece was don't try to look back or try not to look back. And I wholeheartedly rejected that. And I spent the last 18, 19 years trying to figure out what we did right and what we did wrong uh, on the issues that I followed. But I have to say, this memoir, and I will hold it up for all the world to see, uh, lessons from the Edge really sets a new standard in in clarity, honesty, and integrity. Uh, I mean, you've been quite open and honest about your own vulnerabilities, about the imperfections, uh, to say the least, of the Department of State, and you've managed to maintain even even while the previous administration. Uh, you were attacked and uh, attempted to be discredited by the previous administration and by the, the former president. And to use your own words, kicked to the curb, quote unquote, by the very State Department that gave you a home for 30 years. You managed to maintain your faith um, in an optimism, uh, not just in America, uh, but in the capacity of, of the United States and, and America and the power of diplomacy to to do good, it really, it really took someone of extraordinary character, um, not just to weather um, the pressures you were under, but essentially to emerge um, with the view that the the glass was clearly half full, not half empty. And I, I want to begin my conversation with you on the issue of character. Um, where where did that character come from? How is it formed? You, you give a lot of credit to your parents, Michelle and Nadia, um, and and their immigrant background. Um, but can you can you talk to us a little bit about your own background, your faith, and and the influence of your parents on on your, your life and career? Yeah. Um, so so thank you, um, Aaron, uh, for having me. I um, I do give a lot of credit to my parents because uh, they raised me. Uh, they raised me and my brother to be grateful that we were able to, after all of their travails, growing up during World War II, my father was a prisoner of war. He escaped the Nazis. Um, my mother grew up in Nazi Germany and was able finally to um, emigrate after the war to, to, to Britain. And then they mo both made their way to Canada and they met. I was born there. We came to the United States because my, my father got a good job in uh, this bucolic, um, very peaceful town of Kent, Connecticut, a population of 2000 in the rolling, you know, gentle hills of uh, Northwestern Connecticut. And that was a, as about as far away as you could get um, from, you know, the war and destruction and death of World War II. And my parents were just so grateful that they had found refuge in the United States, um, like so many uh, refugees and immigrants to America. They were grateful um, that they um, were uh, living in safety and security, that they were living in freedom where they could say and do what they wanted, where they could worship as they pleased. Um, and uh, they brought us up to give back. Uh, they were teachers themselves, both of them raised generations of students who I think were grateful not only for the lessons in the classroom, but also life lessons because my parents really took in all of those students. And um, you know, then I went to a university, Princeton University, where the, um, the motto was Princeton in the nation's service. And that just resonated with me. And 
I, um, you know, took a lot of detours along the way, as, as one does when one is young. Um, but I finally ended up in the State Department because for me, the Foreign Service married up that desire to give back uh, to America, um, to the uh, American people, uh, but also married up my interests in uh, history, in politics, in travel, in meeting people from different cultures and so forth. And so it was just a really good combination for me. Right. I want to circle back on the, on why, or at least the trigger that prompted you to join the Foreign Service, but I don't want to leave the immigrant experience quite yet. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, m- my grandfather on my um, father's side uh, was born in, in, near, Ky- near Kiev. And there's no question that the resilience and strength there was great resilience and strength in the immigrant experience, but there was also vulnerability. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the I, 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 I listened to an interview you did with a, a David Axelrod. He asked you about the scar, the scars of the immigrant experience and how they shaped your, your own view of yourself and, and um, the way you looked at life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's a a really important question. So, you know, we often talked about the lived experience. I, of course, did not live uh, through World War II. Um, But, you know, for me, um, it's kind of a learned experience because my parents, um, while they didn't talk about it very much at all, they didn't want to talk about it. They wanted me to grow up in, you know, bucolic Connecticut and have, you know, the perfect American childhood. Um, but um, but it it shaped them, uh, not to say that it scarred them, but it shaped them in important ways. We never threw anything away, um, anything, you know, whether it was aluminum, aluminum foil or rubber bands. And I am still like that today. I have drawers <laughs> full of old aluminum foil. I can't throw it away because I can hear my mother saying, what are you doing? We might need that. Um, so that's, you know, that's a funny little example, but there are obviously bigger examples of how you know, my parents really, they were always hopeful. Um, you know, they, they hoped for the best, but they taught us to prepare for the worst, um, that you, you never know when it's going to go away. It is funny. You do talk about your, your need to repurpose just about everything. Um, was there pressure uh, to fit in? I mean, was that, was that part, of, um, part of the challenge? Yeah, I mean, I was like every other kid in America, right? Every, you know, when you're young, you always want to fit in. You always want to be just like everybody else. The worst thing is to be different. And here we were in the 1960s in this um, charming little Connecticut town. You know, my mother (laughs) coming from Germany, a country that that we had been at war with. Now she was half Russian, grew up stateless in Germany. So it wasn't, um, you know, as though she um, bore any responsibility for. And of course, she was a child. Um, but um, my mom being German, um, as understood by um, all of our neighbors, my father being Russian at the height of the Cold War, uh, it was kind of hard to fit in. Um, mm-hmm. My parents, uh, my father at that time didn't speak English very well. Um, so we were all, all sort of learning uh, together. I was learning English uh, at the same time, courtesy of the eight kids who lived next door. And sort of week one, I came back and told my parents, that's it. I'm not speaking any other languages because at the time I spoke German to my mom and Russian to my father as a little three-year-old. And that was it. Um, I only spoke English from then on. And I had to relearn Russian in college and I never regained my German. But I think that's the drive of little kids wanting to wanting to conform. Right. You know, again, you, you describe yourself in the book as an introvert. Uh, yes. Quote, a rules-following diplomat unquote, or a, quote, rules abiding girl, quote, unquote. I'm only raising this because in view of the pressures that you would later be subjected to uh, and your tendency uh, to color between the lines, you were thrown into a situation in which, frankly, the line, traditional lines no longer existed. But we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, so after Princeton, you, I think, went to study Russian. Uh, and you also worked as a nanny for a Canadian diplomat. Then you came back and found a job. I found this fascinating at a Madison Avenue advertising. Was it actually Madison Avenue in the generic sense, or was it actually on Madison Avenue? It was actually on Madison right. Avenue. So it was as an advertising, uh, working working in New York advertising. 
Uh, how did that come about? Because it was during that period that the trigger that um, um, made you want to consider the Foreign Service um, yeah. played itself out. So when I spent that time studying and uh, working in Moscow for about a year after college, um, quite frankly, I had not been impressed with the American embassy in Moscow. Morale was terrible. It was right after uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So there was uh, the Rose Garden strategy of Jimmy Carter, where um, there could be no um, sort of entertaining, et cetera, of Russians and uh, or Soviets. And um, the political appointee ambassador at the time, he had arrived with a multi-million dollar art collection. And his strategy was going to be to woo the Soviets with culture, because that is something, you know, that the Russian um, and, and Ukrainians and others feel very deeply, and it was going to be a way to connect. But that stopped. Uh, he was often out of the country. Um, it seemed to me, you know, as uh, you know, a 20, 21 year old know it all, <laughs> that uh, the embassy was uh, not in great shape. And I thought, well, I can do better than this. And so I cast around and looked for something else to do. And, um, you know, advertising marketing came up. And so I ended up with a job, um, uh, you know, during a recession that I was actually very grateful to get. So then the U.S. invades, this is during the Reagan administration, U.S. invades Grenada. And, um, well, you tell the story because you, you, you tell it in the book about that seemed to be the precipitous cause of your wanting to, to join the Foreign Service. Yeah. So I was, um, you know, I took the subway um, down, um, down to the office and every morning I would read the New York Times on the subway and my commute. And um, there was the news that we had invaded Granada um, to, uh, to rescue some medical students. And I was shocked by this. It, it just seemed to me, again, as a slightly older know-it-all, <laughs> that there must have been a better way. If what we were really trying to do was to get medical students out, that there must have been a better way to do this than to invade a, a little island country. And of course, there was much more to the story, uh, to you know, our policy and what we were doing than, than this. But that's what I was reading. And I walked into the office and I tried to engage, um, you know, our, our my, my colleagues on, on this issue, which I thought was so important. And nobody was really interested. You know, they were looking at a layout. They were talking about the colors. And, you know, it was just an epiphany for me that I needed to be doing something else because what mattered to me was our foreign policy and what were we doing and was it the right thing or not? And what mattered to my colleagues, and that is a legitimate choice, was um the business aspect of things, the creative aspect of marketing to the American public. And I, you know, that's not what got me up in the morning. And uh, I thought I need to marry up my interests uh, with my my job. And so then I went back to the idea of the Foreign Service. All right. So you joined the Foreign Service and your first post is an admin officer in Mogadishu in Somalia. You then went to London where mm -hmm. breaks and they do occur. Uh, create an opportunity to be the staff assistant to ambassador. I think it was Charlie Price was the ambassador. Yeah, um, three, actually three different people. Right. And then a uh, political officer in Moscow, then deputy chief of mission in Kiev, and then three ambassador posts. The first in um, uh, Kyrgyzstan, then Armenia. And then, of course, you you finally come back in uh, to be the ambassador in, in Ukraine. During those years... Um, you, you have a lot of things to say about the people you admired and the ones who you you didn't. But you're quite blunt about the State Department in those early years. You use the term pale, male, Yale, and I would add stale to the list, uh, of what the, the, what the culture was in the Department of State. I mean, I, I, I came into the Department of State in 78, um, but with none of the sensitivities or sensibilities that you that you had as as a woman, but you talk quite openly and honestly about the bias against women during those years. Could you elaborate? Yeah, there 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 was a bias, and in fact, famously, um, there was a class action lawsuit that was brought about uh, around this time, which I ultimately benefited from. And that was that the lawsuit, Allison. That was the Allison Palmer, yeah, yeah, Palmer case. Mm -hmm. Austin, exactly. Um, and it found that the State Department discriminated in the, um, the intake process, in which specialty uh, the State Department assigned to women, in job assignments, and in promotions. 
And this lawsuit went on for years and the State Department fought it every step of the way and um, ultimately had to concede. And um, so in um, 1992, I was one of the people that was offered a remedy um, because the State Department had to provide a remedy. And um, that enabled me to go to Moscow as a political officer. And um, in some ways it felt like my career kind of started there. Although I learned things, you know, as one does, you learn things all along the way. And uh, so I, I really value my experience in Mogadishu and, and, and the earlier posts as well. Um, but the other thing I would say is, you know, there's the, the rules and the regulations and the laws about discrimination and not, you know, just uh, with regard to women. Um, but then there's also this indefinable feeling of, um, you know, do you really belong? Do you belong at the table? Um, are people really taking you seriously and so forth? And I, you know, on, on this part of the book, I mean, throughout the book uh, in the writing process, I did consult with others. But on this one, I really consulted with my um, my fem female colleagues, both from the time and the ones I, I, I now know, uh, you know, was it just me or, you know, is there that feeling out there? And it's really hard to describe. Um, but you just have that sense. It's a feeling when I would walk into a room and I am, you know, a small, um, middle-aged, <laughs> now older uh, woman. Uh, and, you know, I'd be standing next to the strapping uh, foreign service officer who's relatively junior, but he's male and he's tall. And everybody turns to this young man, assuming that that person is the ambassador. I mean, it's things like that, um, that you know, make you feel um, that we women haven't yet completely arrived. And I'm often um, asked, you know, isn't it great? I mean, look at the State Department today with so many senior qualified women at the top. And it, it is great. <laughs> it is great. I mean, I think this is a great group uh, of people leading uh, U.S. foreign policy. But I think it's a measure of how far we still need to go that anybody would even ask that question. It's still something to be noted that there are a number of women at the top doing really substantive work. Yeah, I mean, Madeleine Albright, the late Madeleine Albright, who I, for whom I worked and I interviewed her, um, has stories much along the same lines. In fact, her granddaughter once said to her, Maddie, this is after you, you had three female secretaries of state. Um, she said, uh, Maddie, you're talking to her grandmother, uh, does a secretary, I think it was, does the secretary of state have to be a woman? So there, there, there have been changes for sure. I mean, one bit of trivia, trivia, and I'll raise it because you put it in the book. I was shocked, frankly, and truly not amused, but shocked. Uh, you, you say in the book, uh, why would I know this? Of course, that the, uh, in, in the female restrooms in the department, there were urinals. That's a pretty strong signal, it seems to me, um, uh, to send. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I found that to be fascinating, truly. Really. Um, yeah. and, and, it, and it took me decades to complain about it. I wonder if it's changed. I'm sure it has. Not as of 2019, when I left the department. Um, well, that's, but there's hoping yeah. for progress. <laughs> right. Let's hope so. Um, yeah, the, there's a constant also as I as I read the book and and thought about your your various tours, because it, it it's actually fascinating. Talk about fate. Corruption was one of the key issues that you seem to confront just about everywhere. Mogadishu, Kiev, Moscow, Bishkek, um, and Yerevan, and then again. Uh, in a very personal way, uh, when you became ambassador to, to Kiev, um, you talk about um, some of your experiences, particularly, I think, in I don't know whether telephone justice mm -hmm. the phrase you use was that uh, for in Armenia or was that in Kyrgyzstan when a, 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 a politician or an oligarch picks up the phone and basically tells a judge um what the outcome of the trial should be could you talk a little bit about uh your view of corruption how endemic it was and we'll get to this later what maybe some thoughts about how america can help deal with it in the posts that you served yeah 
So telephone justice, um, as it's called, uh, you know, picking up the phone and ordering a particular verdict, um, and it extended to prosecutors as well, you know, to bring a case or to drop a case. Um, that was a legacy of the Soviet Union, um, where in theory, everybody is equal, but in fact, um, there was a very senior um, slice of the hierarchy, and then everybody else was pretty, pretty miserable. Um, and so all of the successor states to the Soviet Union, the new and independent states, inherited, you know, those systems. And um, while many of them said they wanted democracy, they wanted, um, you know, a, a, a capitalist kind of an economy, et cetera, uh, a market economy, uh, they didn't, of course, know what that meant, really. And they didn't know how to get there. And they asked us to, to help them. Um, but it was really prevalent in all of the countries and continues today um, more or you know less uh, in, in, in all of those countries. In Ukraine, um, I was you know saddened to see um, when I was there as the number two in the early 2000s uh, that it was really quite prevalent. And let me just, and, and, and again, it continues um, or continued up to the war, although the Ukrainians were making progress to fight back against that kind of corruption. And I think that's, that's important to know. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it's a real problem. And here's a, a way to think about it from an American point of view. If you're an American company and you have a partner in, uh, in Moscow or in Kiev, um, you want to know that the legal and judicial structure is going to support you if there is a dispute, because there are always um, business disputes and you hope that you, when you, when you go to court, you're going to get a fair shake. But actually, it's very hard to do in a system like that because Americans are not a part of all of that. Uh, and um, so they can easily lose all of their investments. And it has happened in every single country that I have, um, I have been in, uh, in the former Soviet Union. It happens in other countries, too, where there is no rule of law. So um, it, it points back to why the U.S., um, is all in. When countries ask us to help them to fight corruption, when they ask us to help them strengthen their institutions and help them establish rule of law, we're all in on that because we think it's good for those countries and those countries, but we also think it's good for us because countries like that make better partners for us politically, um, you know, from a security point of view, but also for our businesses economically. Do, do you think the fact that America is now a sort of glass house, um, struggling with its own democratic black backsliding. Um, how serious of a constraint is that? A Freedom House reported in 2019 that the world, I find this not funny at all, that the world's two largest democracies, the United States and India, suffered the most precipitous decline, decline when it comes to uh, democratic norms and practices. Is it a, how much of a drag and a constraint is it? After all, we are now championing you, Ukraine's democracy struggle for freedom and independence, and yet still struggling with uh, a serious problem here at home. Um, I, I, I think it is. We certainly have a serious problem here in the United States, and you know we need to tend and defend our democracy if it is to endure. And that means all of us doing what we can. You know, some people run for office. Um, other people, you know, work on the zoning <laughs> committee board mm. in their local community. All of these things are important um, to, you know, keep our democracy going. Um, and of course, you know, uh, th there there are many other things as well. Uh, but I I I do think that at least in my experience in in the countries and the peoples that I know, those countries are still looking to the United States um, for an example and for leadership. On January 6th and immediately thereafter, um, I can't tell you, I mean, you probably did too, how many impassioned phone calls and texts and messages I received. What is going on? You know, if, 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 if you take this route, what is going to happen to us? I mean, countries are still looking to us um, as the shining city on the hill. Maybe, maybe you know, some of the aura has, has gone um, but they're still looking to us to write our democracy and to continue to work with other countries, maybe not in the same leadership position as before, um, but um, certainly continue to help lead, um, you know, the alliance, um, but also the community of democracies. 
I, and I think it's important to note that when we work with other countries on democracy promotion and, and other things like that, which can be very sensitive because it's about um, making reforms. I mean, reforms are hard in this country. They're hard in other countries too. And uh, we, it means that somebody's probably gonna have to give something up like money or power. And nobody likes to do that willingly. Um, but the reason that we do this is number one, we're asked. We don't usually impose these things on other countries. Usually the government says they want these kinds of assistance programs and we work with them on what that would look like. Um, that's the first thing. Um, but the second thing is the reason we do it is that, you know, it's not because we are so perfect. It's because it's the right thing to do. And we think it will help these countries if they do have a free press and are able to freely, um, you know, assemble and um, discuss the issues of the day so that they can make the right decision when it comes to elections. These things are important. And we clearly have um, our own issues that we need to keep on working on, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't help other countries with their challenges and that we shouldn't. And in fact, maybe in this new era, because I think we, are, we all recognize that we're at a, at a crossroads, maybe in this new era, there are things that we can learn from other countries and it can be you know, a little bit more of a partnership rather than you know, look at the US and our strong institutions um, it can be, we found out our institutions were only as strong as, as our people. Yeah. And that's, um, you need to, you know, kind of have that's both. A, that's a critical point. I want to move on to talk about Ukraine, but I would be yeah. remiss if I didn't give you a chance to talk about uh, the very difficult period that you went through. Nothing uh, could have prepared you for what you experienced. I mean, the worst predicament for a foreign service officer, any civil servant. Uh, and career professionals get caught up uh, in the dysfunctional and, and increasingly vicious and brutal nature of American politics, our own polarization and tribalization. Um, we, we don't have time to go into the ticks and the talks of um, uh, the corruption issue, which uh, essentially uh, uh, led to that phone call in April of 2019 summoning you back to Washington, where you were then summarily dismissed uh, as ambassador. Um, I just wonder, first of all, could you talk a little bit about that? I really want to know how you summoned up the strength uh, to deal with that. Again, everything you knew, everything you stood for, the very home that you had for 30 years, my home for 25 years, uh, did not, well, I guess to quote you again, hung you out to dry. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the salient points there and how you managed to get through that. Well, I mean, without exaggeration, 2019 was the worst year of my life, both professionally and personally. I mean, it was it was just very difficult. In the beginning uh, of 2019, uh, even though Ukrainians were warning me, I didn't really know what was going on. I mean, I could feel, you know, something around me. Uh, you know, they kept on telling me, you know, Giuliani and this corrupt prosecutor Lutsenko have... Um, join forces and uh, want to remove you, but, you know, calling back to Washington, you know, the professionals in Washington, um, everybody was like, no, you're doing a good job. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Keep on doing it. Um, so, uh, you know, then the scandal kind of hit with uh, interviews that Lutsenko, uh, the, pro the prosecutor, uh, gave to the Hill. Um, and uh, pretty quickly, uh, President Trump retweeted one of the articles. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. said, you know, we need to get rid of clowns like this or something to that effect uh, in, a, in a text. And I could tell that I was in very big trouble and turned to the State Department to provide, you know, a statement backing me up because um, I felt that that's what it would take in order for me to be able to survive this if it was even survivable. And I asked for Pompeo to, to um, issue the statement himself. That did not happen. They asked me to basically to, they said that they would review it, but in the meantime, I should put out a statement defending myself that um, it was suggested should include um, saying that I was loyal to President Trump and the constitution. I mean, that to me felt like a real betrayal that, you know, first of all, I was supposed to defend myself, um, but secondly, um, you know, Americans don't pledge their fealty to an individual. You know, we, <laughs> 
we fought a revolution over that principle. And um, so, yeah, so uh, so I declined to do that. Um, and, you know, over the next month, I was, you know, kind of kept in place. Um, but then um, I was brought back, as you said, pretty summarily back to Washington, practically in the middle of the night. Um, and then Deputy Secretary Sullivan at the time told me that I would not, um, you know, be uh, ambassador to Kyiv any longer, even though I had done nothing wrong. And that was almost the worst part of it, that I had done nothing wrong. Um, and yet uh, the State Department was knuckling under to, you know, some plan cooked up by Mayor Giuliani, who was not even a part of the U.S. government. I mean, outsiders were somehow pulling the strings on our personnel policy and as a result on our policy. Uh, and I really worry that this was undermining you know, not just me, but that it was greater, that it undermined our diplomats overseas because bad actors, dictators were looking at this and understanding that they could, you know, they could cut deals if there wasn't um, a, uh, an ambassador that they didn't like who was making, um, you know, following U.S. policy, but making life a little too uncomfortable for them. So it was, um, it was a really difficult time. The gaslighting was incredible. And, um, you know, the lies and, and so forth that were put out there about me. And that's another thing that sort of, why didn't they just fire me? Um, they didn't have to also drag me through the mud. Um, yeah. I mean, that was also, you know, something that was really incomprehensible. Although I think, again, goes back to, um, you know, some of the deals that were struck between Giuliani and Lutsenko. Um, but how did I get through it? Um, you know, friends, family, faith. Um, there's nothing new under the sun here uh, on all of these things, but that was a very dark period for me. And it was a frightening period because, you know, fast forward to the perfect phone call um, and the transcript release of the, the call between President Trump and President Zelensky, where the most powerful man in the world said about me, she's going to go through some things. I, I read this yeah. in September uh, of 2019, and I thought, well, what more can he have in mind? He's already fired me. You, you also had the unfortunate distinction during the during your testimony during the fee, first. You were the first career uh, person to, I think, testify during the impeachment trial, and you had the distinction of because uh, Adam Schiff read out the tweet, literally during your hearings of the for, former president said something like, "Wherever she goes, there's trouble." What does that mean? Something like that. So you reached out deep. But what the anomaly here is for the rules following diplomat, you find yourself and the introvert, you find yourself with a degree of public exposure that is extraordinary for any career public servant. I, I can't remember an example in the recent past of anything close to what you, you went through. And yet you emerge, um, maybe you quote Corinthians, I think, in the book. Correct. Yeah, faith, hope, and love. And the most important of those is love. Yeah. Um, but you made it through, um, Masha Yovanovitch, in a in a way that um, is quite inspiring. So, you now are looking at Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, and uh, a country that you love, a country to which you have have ties. Um, did anything during your tenure there? Uh, suggest to you that there was the possibility of some Russian move into Ukraine uh, along the magnitude of the magnitude that we've watched play out? Is there anything? When I was there, I, I did not anticipate anything like this. I thought that, um, you know, as, as you've noted, I mean, there was a um, hot war in, in Europe uh, since 2014. Um, Every week, you know, two or three people would die, civilians or um, Ukrainian soldiers. And um, I thought that that level of destabilization, along with assassinations, you know, the cyber attacks, the disinformation, I mean, the list goes on, um, that that level of um, destabilizing Ukraine uh, was sufficient uh, for, for Russia. And obviously, I, I was wrong there. Um, and um, so it's, truly 
you know, shocking and, 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 and just, I mean, words fail me um, to think about what is happening right now. And, you know, as we're going into, as the Ukrainians are going into the towns and cities that the Russians have, have departed and seeing the carnage that they have left behind. Um, what about the Ukrainian people? Um, were you surprised or or stunned by their resilience, their, I, I their determination to stand up? I, I wasn't. I knew that they were going to fight back, um, and I think that they are going to keep on going. Uh, it's um, you know this is a group of people who have been fighting off the Russians. For, for centuries and most recently have been fighting the Russians for the last eight years. And um, they are resilient, they are strong, they know that they have their own identity, their own culture and their own homeland. And they have had that for centuries. Um, and you know, when, when the Russians invaded their country, bombed their homes, killed their children, um, they're not just gonna stand by and say, you know, please come on in. They are going to fight for uh, for uh, for their homeland, and that is exactly what they're doing. Ukrainians are brought up on, on Taras Shevchenko, you know, the greatest Ukrainian poetry right. of the 1800s, and he has this famous line: and "All school children learn it: uh, fight on, and you will prevail." And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in Ukraine right now. And I think that even if uh, the Russians prevail militarily. Uh, they are um, going to be faced with uh, a very uh, expensive, shall we say, uh, guerrilla war uh, and civil um, civil disobedience, um, civil unrest on, on the part of ordinary Ukrainians. They're not going to tolerate a Russian occupation. Does it will come at a huge price to the Ukrainian people as well, don't get me wrong, um, but I, I don't see them knuckling under forever. Does the emergence of President uh, now President Zelensky surprise you in any way? Well, I, I mean, it does. Uh, he, you know, he made the transition from being a comedian, um, a businessman and a comedian to being president. And he was, you know, working hard, struggling as all presidents do, but making some progress. And then all of a sudden he transforms, <laughs> it seems overnight into the Winston Churchill of our time. Uh, it, is, um, it is pretty impressive that he is able to reflect the values of the Ukrainian people and bind them together and unite them and inspire them and inspire the world too. Uh, it, it may well be his, his greatest challenge is, in, is the current role he's playing. Uh, if in fact there is a diplomatic off ramp or there is an ending to this crisis, it's gonna require an enormous amount of political skill and courage to find a balance presumably because it, any negotiated settlement, if there is to be a negotiated settlement, we'll have to figure out a way to balance you. I mean, it's hard to say right now, given what the Russians are doing, balance Ukrainian interests. Um, if in fact, there's going to be a negotiated an agreement against whatever, whatever uh, Russian interest the Ukrainian public is prepared to, to accept. And Ukraine, I suspect, is a highly decentralized society. Um, there, it, it, it's going to be very difficult for President Zelensky, I would think, um, to sell any agreement, given the the savagery and the brutality that we're that we're learning about now. And there's, I, I fear, as um, Russian forces recede from other areas, there's going to be a lot more of this. Um, it's going to take a lot from the West. So let me ask you a couple more questions about that. If you had, if you had your five minutes with President Biden, what would the, what would you tell him that you think is not getting through with respect to the way the Americans are processing and reacting to the crisis in Ukraine? Is there anything that, that 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 you feel we don't understand and in understanding adjust our policy accordingly? Yeah, I I actually think that President Biden, uh, given his past experience with Ukraine, given his you know many decades of um, of uh, 
activity and foreign policy um, understands quite well that this is a, a battle about Ukraine and Putin's obsession about Ukraine and belief that the Ukrainian people are just little Russians and that Ukraine is not a country and needs to be, that those lands need to be gathered back into the Russian fold. Um, but it is also about something greater, which is the international order. And Putin has been very clear in his writings and in his remarks that the international order does not work. Um, he wants to go to a might makes right uh, kind of a proposition. And so if Russia is not stopped in Ukraine, he is going to keep on going. He has broader aims, both territorially and more broadly, the um, international system. And I think that is something that President Biden probably understands very well, um, but I don't think the American people understand quite yet um, how, how important this moment is, um, how important it is, not just for Ukraine, but for us. Because if, if Russia succeeds in um, changing the way international relations is conducted, where we don't, we don't respect borders, we don't respect sovereignty, um, it will make us less prosperous, less free, and far less secure. And I think this is something that is not going to be um, settled in the next days, weeks, months. It's going to be years. And we have to be in it for the long term because this is something that actually affects every American. And so how the president of the United States um, explains that to the American people and gets our buy-in and the buy-in of um, you know, our allies to you know, really stay the course on this, I think is gonna be very, very challenging. Yeah, and it, it's, again, it's, it, I'm, I'm very much afraid, particularly as we approach the midterms that and it looks to me like we're we're in for a prolonged crisis um, in Ukraine. That uh, our foreign policy objectives, perhaps the points that you've raised, are going to get caught up in the American electoral cycle. And like everything else in America these days, it's going to become polarized, fractured, and deployed in the service of one party's uh, preferences and agenda or the others. And that's a very serious issue when the political interest substitutes for the American national interest. Um, I, I worry about that greatly. Um, finally, one last question. I'm sorry, one last question. Um, the book is entitled Lessons from the Edge. Um, what's the one lesson above all that you want all of us to learn from your book, from your career, from your experiences, from your experiences? Well, the really important thing to me is um, something that um, George Kennan, a, you know, a, a famous diplomat from the last century, um, wrote about when he wrote about Russia uh, in the 1940s, I believe it was. Uh, he wrote about the Soviet Union um, and the sources of its strength. And what he said is that for our diplomacy to be the strongest, we need to have a strong democracy, a strong economy. Um, it is our values really that are the beacon uh, for the rest of the world. And um, so I think that there is this interplay between our democracy and our diplomacy. Um, our diplomacy needs to serve our de democracy, but our democracy needs to be strong so that our diplomacy can be effective. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very important. And as we close, I would only say that your your whole career and everything you you've you've stood for, um, and the inspiration you derive from your beloved parents, is a, is a emblematic of of what we really need to do, and that is to to turn the M in me upside down, mm -hmm. so it becomes a W in we. And uh, I, I want to thank you, Masha Yovanovitch, for coming on Carnegie Connects. Uh, thank you for your service, your dedication, and your faith in something that is very much uh, disputed these days, and that is the power under right circumstances and under the right American leadership, um, uh, the power uh, of American diplomacy and the power for America, despite all of its imperfections, all of its transgressions, to be a force for good uh, in this troubled world of ours.
So thank you, Masha. Oh, one additional point. Next week, uh, Carnegie Connects will host uh, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates for a discussion of Ukraine. Um, is there a way out? Uh, again, Masha, thank you. And thank, thank uh, everyone for tuning and listening in. Until next time, think positive and definitely test negative. Thank you.